And we are live. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Good morning, top of the morning, January 9th, 2021. Come on in, come on in. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to the Virtual Assistant Principal Leadership Academy. Come on in here. Come on in. Who we got in the building this morning? We got Natoya Coleman is in the building. Eriketta Ara, Kelly's in the building. Janine Wilkins all the way in Alaska is in the building. Principal Dot McKeever's in the building. We got Christy Moore and Demetrius Scott in the building. Crystal Sanders in the building. Monica Welch in the building. We got a lot of people checking in. Hit that share button for me as you come in. We got Coach Sai, Saida, Saida Bryant. O'Brien in the building. We got Priscilla Alexander in the building. John uh, Herricks is in the building. Come on in here. Michael Benton is in the building. Yolanda McKinney's in the building. We got a lot of people in the building. I can't even keep up with it. Maurice, uh, Mr. Tanya Pugh is in the building. Uh, Tega Missouri's in the building. We are from George Appen. Uh, I think it said Applin is in the building. Man, the names are coming in so quick. We got so many people. Come on in. Otis Kitchen, Principal Kitchen is in the building. I got to reach out to you, Principal. I know we got to get that going. I keep, I've been, man, I've been swamped. We're going to get it done. TB Summers in the building. Stacey Lewis Davis is in the building. Hit the share button. Hit the retweet button. We're on four platforms as always this morning. We are on Facebook Live. We're on Virtual Assistant Principal Leadership Academy Live, which is on Facebook. We're on Twitter Live. We're on YouTube live. We're live on four platforms. Enough for everybody to check on in here. And the one that works for you best, Angela Smith is in the building. AJ and Bianca is in the building. Jeff Leslie is in the building. We got a lot of people in the building. Kimberly Broughton Kafele, the wife, is in the building. Come on in, hit the share button, folks. Hit the retweet button. Let them know we're getting heavy today. You all see the title. We're getting heavy. We're getting heavy. We're talking from the vantage point of educators, though. I'm not a politician. I don't talk politics. I talk education. So we're going to talk education today. I think I'm going to have to spill this into two parts because when I put it together, I couldn't stop writing. Vincent Taylor's in the building, but I'll talk more about that. Lakeisha Mabry's in the building. Who else? We got my daughter, Cabria Jesse, is in the building coming out of Hampton University, HBCU, senior, graduating this year. Uh, we got we got Shy, uh, Shy Glove in the building, Camelia Scott in the building, Chris is in the building. My my daughter Cabrera, it's moving so fast. I can't even I can't keep up with it. It's it's because I got I got four platforms on here, so it's just it's just moving. I can't I don't know where I'll read it when I'm finished. Donald Thompson's in the building. Kerry, oh man, I can't make it. Joyce Elaine is in the building. Hafiz Melton's in the building. Hey, Hafiz, get your daughter on here. Tell her to tell her to check on here. His daughter's one of my former students. Tell her to tell her to get on here. And see what a principal's doing, her former principal. Well, we, we once 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 I'm the principal, I'm always the principal. <laughs> JS is in the building. Hit that share button, somebody. It's almost that time. Hit that retweet button, somebody. It's almost that time. I got I got a lot to discuss. I wrote more notes than I've written in the 37 weeks. Um we started this. Well, I'll get into that in a few minutes. It's almost that time, 1059. Elizabeth Sneed Kirkland is in the building. Superintendent Finch is in the building. Stephanie Jacobs is in the building. We got a lot of folks here. Keep on hitting that share button. Keep on hitting that retweet. Tag somebody. Share it to a group. You know, there could be a group out there that you belong to. Share it to them. You know, the particularly principal's leadership group. The principal desk group. What's the other one? Principals and school directors, um, et cetera, group. Black educators rock group. Black school administrators group. You know, those of you that belong to these various groups, share it over to them, too, so we can get a lot of people on here. I don't typically share to the groups myself, but I certainly have no issue with you sharing to those various different Facebook groups that are out there. Look here, folks. It's 11 o'clock. And you know I start on time. So let me say now formally, good morning. Greetings. 
and welcome to the 37th session of the virtual assistant principal leadership academy and as i always say i don't know about you i don't know but as if i could speak for me i'm on fire i need to say that again man i need to get this out of me i'm on fire what am i saying you know I'm saying despite, and, 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 and every week I say it is cliche, I guess, the, the challenges that abound, I'm not going to let it extinguish my flame. Well, we had a week, but my flame is still raging, right? I'm on fire. So, you know, real quick, my, my, my message before we get into the message, my message, I'm calling it leadership requires courage. Once again, Leadership requires courage. You know, you, you could aspire to become an assistant principal. You can aspire to become a principal. You can aspire to become whatever, a teacher, a counselor, right? You can aspire to become a director, a supervisor, assistant superintendent, or even superintendent. But I'm going to tell you right now, and those of you who are in those positions, you know this. You cannot lead effectively or optimally if you lack courage. You have to have the spine, the backbone, the audacity to move in certain directions, even when it's not a popular direction to move in, but your gut tells you, I got to move the school in this direction. I got to move the staff in this direction. You got to have the courage. You got to have the backbone. You've got to have the spine. You've got to have the guts. You've got to have the audacity to lead. See, you, you, you got to have courage. You got to have heart. I was doing an interview yesterday and, 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 and the interviewer asked me about my toughest time in education. And I mean, I talked about it more than I probably ever have. And, 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 and as I was reflecting on it, that's what led me to use this as my opening message. I said, the only reason I got through it was because of my courage, right? I wasn't willing to back down. I wasn't willing to cave in. I wasn't willing to throw up the white towel. I wasn't willing to say, I give up, I quit. I said, I'm forging ahead and came out on the other side stronger than ever. We'll tell that story at some point, but not today. So you got to you got to have courage. Leadership requires courage. My word of the week. My word of the week is version, V-E-R-S-I-O-N, version. What am I saying? I'm saying as a leader, despite whatever challenges, obstacles, pressures, demands that you are confronted with and confronted by, you've got to bring the best version of yourself. Every time you step outside of your home, you got to bring the best version of you. You can't bring that second rate version, that average version, that below average version. You got to bring the best you because your students require it. You got to bring the best you because your staff require it. The parents require it. The, the community requires it. So version, think about the like, like you, you look at a book. Books have different versions. You got the first, the first edition, the second edition, the third edition. You know, book is hot, so they keep revising it. So it's got these versions, right? Well, I'm saying to you, the version that may have started on the first day can't be the same version of you saying week in, in month five, month six, year two, year three. It's got to improve. So you got to make sure that the version of yourself is getting better and better, but not by the month per se, but by the day. I could even say by the minute you are constantly striving to evolve into the best version of yourself as you are moving forward. So I'm going to use that word version to segue into my topic today, which is school leadership in times of social unrest, uprisings, rebellions and riots. Folks got to bring the best version of themselves. That's what we got to do. So I want here's what I want you to do, somebody. Hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. Let them know it's week 37. We got things to talk about. We really got things to talk about today. But, you know, before I jump into it, I, I, I still got to do this. <laughs> this is an assistant principal leadership academy. 
right? We do it virtually and we do it for free. It's, it's, it's an assistant principal leadership academy. So I would be remiss to talk about anything if I don't remind you that I want you to have this book as your companion. Now, now is, is today's topic in this book? No, it's not in this book. It's in the forthcoming book that comes out in May, the, the Equity and Social Justice Education 50. It'd be all in there, right? But I also want you to get the aspiring principal 50. So the assistant principal 50, the aspiring principal 50, you can get them both at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, principalcafele.com, wherever you get your books. They're there, right? And I thank all of you for making this one a, a quick bestseller. Um, it's, it's still new. It's like six, seven months new and it's a bestseller on Amazon, bestseller ASCD. So I thank all of you for those of you who made the purchase thus far and those who will. I thank you all for making it a bestseller. Right. That's a that's a true blessing. All right. Um, our underlying question, does the assistant principalship benefit my school academically? That's that's what drives the 55 weeks of this academy. Does my assistant principalship benefit, move, drive my school academically? And that's including today's topic. So let me let me let me cut jump right into it now. And I want to start it by saying this. It's been an interesting week, y'all. Matter of fact, I'm looking at my shirt. You know, you know, I'll be remiss if I don't tell you what I'm wearing. It's, it's Negro Leagues, y'all. Pittsburgh Crawfords. Uh, a lot of stars play for this team. A lot of people don't realize Sat Satchel Page played for them. Josh Gibson played for them. You know, a lot of people play for this, this particular team as well. But I'm real short. Pittsburgh uh, Crawfords. Let me jump into it. It's been an interesting week, y'all. It's been interesting. And, you know, it's it's you know, I'm, I'm, I've been writing notes ever since it started. I had I had already prepared the agenda for today. It was it, we were dealing with like district policy, teacher contracts and a whole lot of other things. And then this happened on Wednesday, the 6th. And I said, there goes that agenda. And that's for a later week, because this will probably take me two weeks. So I said, there goes that we we going to have to get into this. I'm starting. I started writing notes and revising and editing, revising and editing up all night last night, revising and editing up tonight, revising, editing, adding all that kind of stuff up this morning, I should say. And here we are. School leadership in times of social unrest, uprisings, rebellions and riots. Right. And and and, and I'm not zeroed in solely on what happened on the six. You know, I'm not cause, because this, as I have here in bold letters to remind you all, this is not a political message. I'm not a politician, right? This is not a political presentation, political message, political discourse. That's not what today is. Today is the same thing we've been doing for 36 previous weeks. Today is, is solely about us as leaders in the wake of whatever social unrest is out there, in the wake of whatever rebellions, rioting, uh, insurrection, whatever it is, what is our role? What do we do? Where do we fit in this? Right. That's that's what this message is about today. So it's not a political presentation. But I want to say this. The difference between today and the previous 36 weeks, the previous 36 weeks, I spoke to you as a presenter. Today, I'm speaking to you as a black male principal. Right. So I'm still a presenter, obviously, because I'm the one that's, that's running my mouth. But I'm but I, but I don't have that presenter hat on. I'm speaking to you as a black male principal to my principal colleagues, my assistant principal colleagues, my aspiring assistant principal colleagues, my aspiring principal colleagues and, and, and others who are out there. If the trolls show up on the thread because they showed up on my Twitter page when I put the tweet out that I was doing this. Please disregard, please ignore, please do not engage in any discussion with them. I'm asking you that, right? Because they've already been on my Twitter page. So please, when you if they show up on this feed, please disre disregard, ignore, and focus on this discussion, right? Now, I want to speak to you again as a, as, as a black man. And I'm saying to you as, as a school, as a black male principal, and I'm saying to you as, as school leaders, not talking about the various issues of social justice, racial justice, or social injustice, or racial injustice issues with your staff, not having those discussions. This is me now. It's unacceptable. It's not okay, right? Let me repeat that again. Not engaging 
in those issues with your staff of social justice, social injustice, right? Racial justice, racial injustice, not engaging your staff in those conversations is unacceptable. It is not okay. And let me tell you why. Because a lot of times it's, it's, it's easy for us to look at the outside world, and I'm pointing that way because there's my front window to my home, right? So it's easy to look at the world outside and to look at the world inside. I see, I see my guy, Dr. Marcus Jackson, in the building. So I don't usually shout out right, right now, but I, but when when I see him, I got to, right? So 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 we it's 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 easy to see the outside world and then the inside the classroom and treat them as these two separate entities. It happens. So we'll say, here, here's, here's the way to speak the language will sound. We're in the class classroom getting the youngsters ready for the, for the real world. That's what we'll say. We're getting the youngsters ready. We're preparing them for the real world. And, and, and see, me instinctively going back to my first day as a teacher in 1988, that never made sense to me. I said, no, I, I'm not getting them ready for the real world because if that out there, when they get older, is the real world, then what is this right here? The fake world? The pretend world? The play play world? See, see, in my mind, and this is going back to 88 all the way to 2021, in my mind, the world out there and the world in the classroom are one in the same, as Booker T. Washington said, one as the fist, not separate as the fingers. So, so this world here, the classroom is just the microcosm of the world out there. But it's not me getting ready for this fantasy fictitious place that they will wind up in one day. Because when they come in from school in the morning, they're coming in from their world. And their world, in terms of a class of, say, 25, their world may be very different from one another. So you've got worlds coming into a classroom. <clears throat> so if that's the case, if, I, if I'm even a modicum of, 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 of a degree correct, then I'm saying to you as a staff, as a leader, I'm sorry, as a school leader, to ignore or to be afraid to have the conversation about social justice, social injustice, racial justice, racial injustice, and to not engage staff in those conversations because of what I just said is unacceptable. It is not okay. Because those social injustices, those racial injustices, they impact your children directly. They impact your students directly. It is not okay. But secondly, as a staff of educators, now I'm talking about everybody, not just the leadership, as a staff of educators, not talking about these various issues. So I'm talking educator to child, as a staff, as teachers, to not engage the children in the discussions, to not be honest with them. To not to, 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 to not have the courage to engage them in these conversations is not acceptable. It is not okay. For the same reason I said as the other, because the world and the classroom are one. They're one. You and I can't can't pretend that that what's happening out there is not happening. Or you and I can't can't have the mindset that it, it has no place in my classroom. Why doesn't it? The classroom is about bringing out the best, bringing out of the youngster. You think about the word educate in, 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 in the Latin translation, educe. We, we, we're talking about the Greek translation. We're talking about bring out. So in terms of bringing out of a youngster, we're, we're talking about the world, not just some compartmentalized 
content area classes, right? Or courses. So, so that's not okay. But then number three, along the same vein, as the host of the Virtual Assistant Principal Leadership Academy, to not engage my audience in issues of social justice, social injustice, racial justice, racial injustice is unacceptable. That's me now owning that. It's unacceptable. It is not okay. See, I have to, right? Because I'm talking assistant principal leadership. I took it upon myself to launch a virtual assistant principal leadership academy and said, assistant principals all over America and all over the world, tune in either live or during the week on the video. And then I'm afraid of tough issues. Then I'm not authentic. In fact, I'm a fraud. See, I got to take on the tough issues. And you know I've done that over the, the 37 weeks with various different things that go on in the world. So here we are. Let me tell you something, folks. We're getting ready to get heavy. Strap up your seatbelts, man. We're getting heavy. Right? I hope, I hope that everybody that's on here this morning that decided to come on here, I hope you can tolerate this conversation because it's a necessary conversation. Right? Here, I'm saying as a leader, and I'm gonna keep it educational. I'm not going to, 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 to step into the political world. We're gonna keep this thing educational, right? So toward talking about social justice, the goal, and I'm talking about you talking to your staff in particular right now, the goal has to be empathy and understanding, right? Because you got, you got this broad spectrum on any given staff anywhere. Of 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 here. So 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 on the one hand, whatever their thoughts, their thinking is, their values, their beliefs, right, their views, their perspective. That's what it is right here. But then on the other hand, you got the opposite, the complete opposite, and then you've got everybody in between. You can't necessarily just go in there, bam, with your values, with your ideas, with your thoughts, with your position, right? It, because it's, because you're going to lose the staff. Remember, I said we're talking education because at the end of the day, you guys have to be a solid team. You can't be fragmented. You all over the place. You can't because now you can't move together as one. So now that's where we talked about in previous weeks, those people skills. No, learning your staff, getting to know your staff so that you know how to approach the various stakeholders within your staff. Because the ultimate goal is, is empathy. I so, so teacher, I want you to understand what life is in my shoes as I attempt to understand what life is in your shoes, right? And then ultimately that goes right down to the young person. So empathy, understanding, but I can also add the words appreciation and respect. So therefore, colleague, I see the world through a different lens than you, but don't, but don't tear me down for that. Understand my position. Empathize with my position, but, but, but don't go to war with me for my position and vice versa. Right. So 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 that that becomes the goal in your discussion, in your building your team under this umbrella of social justice, racial justice, that we're going to have understanding. I'm not necessarily trying to change your values. What I want to do is get you to understand mine. As I attempt to understand yours, but neither one of us undermining or sabotaging the children that we service every day, right? So let's keep going. I'm saying, therefore, there's a reality that we have to look at, such as you got two or more people looking at the same stimuli, right? Two or more people looking at the same thing. Chances are, matter of fact, let's just put a number on it. You got 10 people looking at the same stimuli, the same issue. The same, the, listening to the same conversation, whatever it is, chances are you may have 10 different perspectives looking at the same thing. Like I hold up an ink pen and I say, what do you see? And person, one person might say, I see an ink pen. 
But someone else might say, well, I see the green and that green has certain value for me. Another one might say, well, I see the ink itself. Another one might see, I see opportunity. Right. Another another one might might say, oh, I see where someone wrote me a ticket recently. I mean, I can keep going because we're looking at the same stimuli, but it has different meaning. For different people. Right. You have to consider that when we talk about the social justice, racial justice conversation. So so that's I'm using that as the bridge to get to where I need to be. I couldn't go bam at you at 11 o'clock because I can I got different perspectives on this call. Right. So now. So, for example. Here's the example I want to use. Black men in education. When we talk about different people looking at the same stimuli, let me use this as a quick example. Black men in the classroom, teachers. For, for those of you that are not aware, black men comprise one between 1.2 to 1.3 percent of the total teaching force in America. Let me say that again for anybody that didn't realize that. Let me say that again for someone who's in a, in, in a in a very urban inner city school where you see an abundance of black men and you just assume it must be all over the place. No, they, they're all in your school. Black men comprise 1.2 to 1.3 percent of the total U.S. population of of educators. That's it. That's virtually non-existent. So when we talk about different people looking at the same stimuli. Someone may look at that and say, man, they're not interested. Or someone may look at that and say, man, they, they, they don't they don't seem to care about being in the classroom. Yeah, you know, whatever they come up with. But then you go and interview some black men. And you're going to get a different point of view about the same thing. I talked to a lot of them and I was one of them. And it's a lot of black men in education, in the classroom or who have left the classroom for reasons such as a feeling of a lack of respect for them a lack of appreciation for them, a lack of value toward them and their intellect, for example. So black men being pushed to these disciplinary roles as, as when students are, are misbehaving, exhibiting undesirable behavior, send them down the hall and Mr. So-and-so, he'll take care of it. And, and you got a lot of black men who came into this, edu the, the majority of black men who did not come into the classroom to be the babysitter for the rest of the school or to be the disciplinarian for everybody's problems. So, so you got a lot of black men who are insulted by that, who say, look, I came into this thing for the same reason you did. I wanna teach my students, but I wanna be valued. I want my opinion to be valued. I want my input to be valued. I want my intellect to be valued. But you find a whole lot, cause see, I was there, I know something about that. So, so now, you know, whether it be administration or, or, or by colleagues, mine wasn't administration, mine was more colleagues. Administration was fine with me. So so here, so you got black men say, man, I'm undervalued here. I'm underappreciated here. I'm underrespected here. Right. So so now we're looking at the same stimuli, 1.2, 1.3%, but we didn't peel back the layers to figure out, but why is that? Right? So so I'm saying I'm using that as an analogy. I'm using it as an example just to say that you and I can look at the same thing, but see something different. It takes me to January 6th, right? Here's my example. You're gonna have if 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 you're sensitive, put on your sensitivity gloves. Like, like let me, I got some sitting right here. They're black because they're my running gloves. Um, put on put these on, right? If you're sensitive and you can't handle something that's a little 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 rough this morning, put put these on, right? Put put on put on put on your sensitivity gloves so that we can get through this thing. But you but if you're sensitive, I don't know if you should be in this business. Right. You you, you, you got to have a, a, a stiff upper lip. Right. So 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 let's jump into it. January 6th, I'm looking at this thing not as a, a presenter. I mean, I am as a presenter. I guess I was because I know I'm going to talk about it, but I'm also looking at it as a principal. But I happen to be an African-American. So I'm looking at it as an African-American principal. Like I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking on the one hand, if I was in the school as principal, how am I going to handle this? What am I going to say? It's no question of if whether or not I'm going to handle it. It's a question of how do I broach it, right? But but what are we talking about, right? What broach what? That's the question. Broach what? And I got to put some of y'all comments on the screen. Broach what? See, here's what I'm saying. There's this this turn. I, I tell you, I'm not going to get political. There's this this slogan out here in America, 
And it goes like this. Make America great again. Right now, I need to explain this. I want you all to hear me. Put your ear to this speaker. Make America great again. I want you all to hear me, man. This is the most important message I'm probably going to do in the 55 weeks. I'm a black man. I have tolerance for make America great. I have tolerance for that. In fact, I can embrace that. I have zero tolerance for make America great again. And as, as educators out there, you need to hear why. I'm a black man. I look at the world through a black lens. I hear the world through black ears, right? That's, I mean, that's just, that's just who I am. So when I hear or see make America great again, I cringe. I, I get angry. I get, I get, I get furious. And let me tell you why, because I need you to hear me. If the trolls come on here, please disregard them. Because I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to show up. See, you have to know history. See, I'm a student of American history, but I'm particularly a student of the of, of the absent component of American history. See, see, when we talk about like February, we say Black History Month. As much as I'm a fan of Black History Month, it's almost insulting. And here's what I mean by that. The need there was a need for Black History Month because it was ignored in American history. Right. So because it was an ignored via Ameri the teaching of American history, there was a need to highlight black history separately. But black history is, is a part of American history. It's a major part of American history, but it's the part that has been either marginalized, distorted, omitted, right? So, so deleted. So, so therefore, I'm saying this, if you're a student of American history, and you also understand African-American history within American history, then you know, I'm not telling you anything new, you know that there's no era in American history. There's no year in American history that we can go to and identify and say that this was a good era, this was a good year for Black people. It does not exist. Hear me again. I'm going to say it again. If you understand history, if you have been reading history thoroughly and you zeroed in on the African-American component of history, the African-American experience, there's no era, there's no year, there's no month, there's no day that we could say for the masses of black people, that was a great era that I would like to go back to. It does not exist. There, see, what does exist are, is a multiplicity of examples of Black excellence during oppression, Black excellence during enslavement. That does exist. So you got people who emerge despite some of the worst oppression that, uh, that the world has ever known in America, particularly during the period of enslavement and Jim Crow, right? So I'm saying, I'm saying here, that when I hear make America great again, see the word, the, 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 the operative word is again. Hear me, somebody. That's why I'm yelling. The word again. What is there between 1619 and 2021 that I, as a black man, want to go back to? See, there's nothing there that I want to go back to. Nothing. See, again, I can look at history. I can look at Mary McLeod Bethune and say, oh, man, she was awesome. I can look at Ida B. Wells and say, oh, man, she was awesome. I can look at Sojourner Truth and Harry Tubman and say, oh, they were awesome. I can look at Garvey and say he was awesome. I can look at Malcolm and say he was awesome. I can look at W.E.B. Du Bois and say he was awesome. I can look at I, I mean, I can just go do the roll call for the rest of the presentation. So I won't do that. And I can say they were awesome, but I cannot say, so therefore that was a magnificent period for the masses of black people. I can't do it. And if you can find that person who can, 
send them my way. I'm at principalgafele at gmail.com, right? So I'm saying to you, it doesn't exist. So when I hear the word again, I'm like, ah, you're talking about some dark periods as it relates to black people, right? So, so now, Let's get into it. I'm getting, I ain't even get deep yet. So now I'm saying that in that vein, these were the make America great again folks that were there. I saw more of them flags that had the president's name than I saw American flag. Right? So I saw more red hats than I've ever seen in my life. So now I'm watching it as an educator. I'm watching it as a black male educator, black male principal. That's how I saw it. And I'm not going to apologize for that because that's my reality. So when I saw it, saw it, and I saw, I'm, I'm watching how the cameras are panning the crowd and as they're moving closer to the Capitol. And then I see them sitting along the cap. I'm like, man, they sitting on the building. What's getting ready to happen? And then next thing you know, they invaded. And it became, as the word is being used by a lot of people, insurrection. But here's the thing. I'm not getting political. This is not a political message. We're talking education. I'm saying to you, when I watch that, here's what my mind said. As a student of history and knowing history the way I know it, I've seen this energy many times. Let me tell you all something. Hear me, somebody. Hear me. Hear me. I'm saying this. Remember when I told you several weeks ago, several months ago in May, when George Floyd lost his life, when George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer over a period of eight minutes and 46 seconds. Remember when we had that conversation one week, we spent the whole session on that. But do you remember I told you that there should not be a black person in America that is surprised by what happened. We are outraged by it. We are alarmed by it. We are angry by it, but we are not surprised by it because there's too much history. The only difference is it was videotaped on a spy cell phone video. So we saw a man die on video, right? That was the difference. So we we watched a man die by someone who 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 took the oath to protect and serve. We watched that. Some some of us some of us all practically watched it live, particularly people who were there watched it live. So I said black folks weren't surprised. I like to meet a black person that was surprised. We were outraged, but we weren't surprised. But the beauty is others beyond the black community. Were, were, were equally as outraged and surprised, right? So now let me bring that back to the Capitol. I'm watching this mob, man. They stormed. They went right through the police. Some of them got permission from the police. We saw it. That's not my, that's not my theory. It's on camera. They just went in there breaking glass, tearing up property, taking documents, throwing documents around, urinating, defecating, you know, all that stuff, right? I'm sitting there watching it. I want y'all to hear me. Don't somebody leave here. I can't tolerate cafe later today. Uh, no, 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 you stay right here, right? I'm saying to you, as I'm watching this, I said, I've seen this energy before. I've seen it for centuries. I didn't witness it. I read about it. I watch movies. Several years ago, my wife and I, we went to see the movie Rosewood. I'm getting ready to talk about this too. We getting, we getting, I ain't even where I need to be yet. We went to see the movie Rosewood. It was about a white mob, just tore up Rosewood, Florida. Just, just tore it up, burned it down. My wife and I, we've never experienced this prior to, and we've never experienced this after. We sat in that movie and we cried for two hours, two hours, nonstop. We did not stop crying in that theater i told my wife i don't want to see this movie ever again i can't I, I just can't look at it anymore and i have this temptation to look at it but i can't right so we sat there and we we got to see the the visual of what we had read over the years 
of, of mob violence toward black people, right? Now I know the capital wasn't toward black people, but I'm, but, but I'm gonna still show you the racial component, right? So, so now just going through the city, going through the city, just killing folks, killing folks, killing folks, right? That's, that's, that's what the movie was about, 1923. So when I watched the folks going to that capital, when I watched folks sitting at various desks and podiums and carrying podium, I said, man, I seen this energy before. This ain't nothing new. Y'all hear me, somebody. I said, this ain't nothing new. But then the nail, the nail, the coffin shut was when I watched that man with that big Confederate flag walk into that, walk, walk into that lobby, right? I guess it's called a vestibule. Walked and and walked into there with that with that Confederate flag pole on his shoulder with that flag. I said, "Man, look at this, man." I said, "I've seen this before. I've seen this movie. This is nothing new. I've seen this energy." Cause see, for someone that may not want to see the racial angle, <laughs> all you gotta do is look at that flag. Now there's somebody on video and say, this flag is unacceptable in this capital right now. Get this out of here. Then I, then I stand corrected, right? That flag was the symbol of everything that was happening that day. Now I'm, I'm not talking politics though. I'm talking educational leadership. I'm saying your students saw this. They, they, now some students didn't see it because some teachers wrote me and said, my, I didn't know what to do because none of my students knew what I was talking about, right? So. And therefore, that's that's your role to teach. But I'm talking about the students saw because other teachers said to me on, online, they said, man, my, my students were outraged. And, and, and I took a back seat and I just let them speak. And I said, I applaud you for that because you because they, you, they didn't need to hear you right then and there. What they needed was to have a forum to be able to articulate themselves, in some cases to vent. Right. So I said, I applaud that. Right. So so so, so I'm saying all that to say this. I've seen it before. Let me give you some examples. I just got some salient examples. I, you know, I, I, I want to do a history lesson, but but you got you got lynchings that took place from 1882 all the way to 1968, and some might argue and beyond. Over 4,700 lynchings in America between 1882 and 1968, and some of those lynchings were attended by upwards of 10,000 people. I want you to think about a professional basketball game or maybe a college a college basketball game with an arena that holds about 10,000 10, people, advertisements, postcards, which I have several on, on my computer, postcards to advertise what was about to occur and then postcards to promote what happened. So pictures of the of the person, male or woman, hanging from a noose, right? So when I saw the noose on the Capitol grounds on Wednesday, I want you. I know y'all tuned in to hear something else, but this this is where I'm at this week because because again I'm talking to you. I'm still talking assistant principal leadership or leadership in general. When I saw, see, I, I'm, I'm you and I. We see images of nooses all the time, but here's what I've never seen. These eyes have never seen this before. That wooden frame. I've never seen that. I just see nooses, but when I saw that wooden frame. And then the noose hanging down in front of the Capitol. And I and I and I saw them red hats. They said, I'm not even gonna say that little word they, they made up out. I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna spell it out. Make America great again with the Confederate flag, with the noose. How you want me to feel? See, I'm a black man, and I'm not gonna just look at that as some fictional movie on television. That was real. So now as a leader, I have to have the spine to engage my staff in that conversation because they have to understand that as well. I'm not trying to change them. I just didn't want them to be empathetic toward the leader in terms of his perspective as it relates to the children that we service every day because that's who it's about at the end of the day. So again, I'm not just talking about storming the Capitol. That's 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 bad in and of itself. But I'm talking about the imagery of a Confederate flag, the imagery of a noose with 
the frame to hold the noose up. That means, I mean, let, let, let's 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 look at what that means. That means that the structure to lynch somebody was in place if somebody decided that this is what I want to do today on January 6, 2021 in front of the Capitol. They had the structure, not just someone walking around with a noose that wants to draw attention. I have a noose. No, they had the structure in place to take somebody and hang them in front of that cap. See, I'm looking at that. Let me ask you the question. Let me ask you the rhetorical question. You can, in fact, you can write these comments in here. You know, I read all these when I'm done, y'all. Hey, somebody out here, not just the black folks on this thread. I'm talking to everybody out here. My white friends out here. Did you look at it that way? Did you see it that way? See, where did you go beyond the surface of 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 folks storming the Capitol? Did you dig a little deeper? Right. Did did you see the racial component? Did you see the make America great again? See, that's key. That word again. And then see the Confederate flag and then see the noose and then have reflections of mob violence. So, the, so, so those lynchings were, they were a big party. These were advertised events. It wasn't like randomly we string up some black man, some black woman and lynch him and we go on about our business. This was a big event. Thousands of people would be there. A mob would be there. When I saw what I saw, it took me right back to that ugly, disgusting place. So you have thousands that would be in attendance Google it. It's the pictures are there. The people are smiling. They're eating. They're they're partying. They're eating popcorn while they watch a black man hang from a from a, from from a tree. That's where I was on Wednesday. See, and I'm saying, as leader, because I, I wish I had some of my staff on here. They will tell you, I don't shy away from these topics because they have to be discussed. So, so lynching from 1882 to 1968. But then you got, you know, you know like, like you, if, when you read history, you'll see language that says race riots. That's not true. I don't know that there's been a race riot in the history of America. They're not race riots. They're race massacres. But they use the word riot to give the impression that it's, it's two groups actually having an equal fight one, against one another. No, no, these are, ma you had, so you had the massacre in Atlanta in 1906, Omaha in 1919, Chicago 1919, Tulsa, which I'm gonna get to in a second, in 1921, Rosewood in 1923. But let's go to Tulsa for a minute. We talk about Black Wall Street. We talk about them hundreds of businesses. I mean, hundreds of businesses. We talk about an environment in, 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 from, from leading the, the early 1900s all the way to 1921, where you had black businesses to the extent that the people, the residents of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, never had to leave the community because everything they needed was in the community. The dollar never left the community. The dollar just exchanged black hands, black hands. It never had to leave. So now it's burned to the ground. We're talking 1,000 256 homes were burned to the ground. That's not a race riot. That's a massacre. We're talking over 200 businesses burned to the ground. We're talking about 35 square blocks burned to the ground. We're talking about in airplanes, kerosene bombs dropped onto Greenwood section of Tulsa in, during that massacre. And the only thing left standing is a church. It's still there. It's the structures there. That's the only thing standing. Nothing else there. That's no right. When I saw that mob invade that Capitol, and when I heard about the explosives that, that several of those people had with them, all I could think of was Black Wall Street. They had explosives, y'all. But I'm not being political. I'm, being, I'm an educator. I'm talking about what are you going to say to your staff? What are you going to say to your students? Do you have the courage? Hey, superintendent out there watching me right now, might be some superintendents on here. You're going to unleash your, your, your principals so they can deal with this, so they can have these conversations because there's no such thing as the world out there 
in the world, in the classroom as being two separate entities. They are not. They are one. They are one and the same as the fists, not separate as the fingers, as Booker T. Washington said. So therefore, so but then in addition to and, and that's just some of the massacres. Let me let me let me let me jump up some cent some some decades. The Little Rock Nine. Oh man. Don't leave me, somebody. Stay here with me. The Little Rock Nine. Nine African Americans attempting to teenage African Americans attempting to integrate Little Rock Central High School in Little Rock, Little Little, Little, Little Rock, Arkansas. I was reading a comment here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Nine teenagers. Let me tell you something, somebody. I speak in Little Rock or, or different parts of Arkansas regularly. And whenever I'm in Arkansas and the folks in, I might have some of my Arkansas, my Little Rock colleagues on here and they would know. I gravitate to that high school and stand in front of that high school. I stand at that front door. You go and you scroll my profile on Facebook. You, you scroll the profile pics. You'll see pictures of me standing right at that front door, man. That's a place I go to all the time just for just just as a place of just rejuvenation. Right. Because I'm saying they had the courage. The mob. Hundreds of people, if not thousands, outside waiting for him every morning, cussing them out, throwing objects at them, forming a blockade so they couldn't get through. They had to be escorted by the U.S. Army. I, I, somebody out here, one of them young heads out here don't even know this. Let me say it again. These nine black students, 1957 attempting to integrate Little Rock Central High School had to be escorted by the U.S. Army every day. First, there was an injunction against them even being able to attend school for about three or four weeks. And then finally, on September 25th, 2000, um, 1957, they were allowed to enter. But they had to be escorted for their safety. When I say safety, I mean the ability to stay alive by the U.S. Army every day for the duration of the school year and not just escorted to the building but escorted from class to class and dismissal hey somebody when i watched january 6 on wednesday i went back to the little rock nine the sit-in movement 1960 starting with the greensboro four at woolworths in downtown greensboro I went right back to him when I watched January 6th. The Freedom Ride starting in 1961 and the beating down and the bombings of those interstate buses at those bus terminals. I went right back to them Freedom Riders when I watched that mob violence on January 6th. Selma, Alabama. I'm sorry, I skipped one. Birmingham, 1963. When I watched that, it took me right back to Birmingham. Selma, March 7, 1965, when I watched that, it took me right back to Selma. Cicero, Illinois, in Chicago land, suburb of Chicago, when Dr. King was there, after a young black teenager was murdered in Cicero. It took me right back there. Dr. King was hit with a brick. It took me right back there. His birthday's coming up on the 15th, by the way. So all these reflections, and then obviously the treatment by the by by by, by the, um, the, the 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 mob at the Capitol by the police, right? So I'm saying all that to say this: that has to be discussed, y'all. We you you and I can't be afraid of that. You and I can't run away from that. So the discussion, let's look at it. I got some notes here. What time is it? Okay, we got a little time. So I'm gonna do a part two next week. But 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 right now, unless unless somebody puts on here, they say no, just stay on and do the whole thing. Listen, Kim Wilson Daniels out there taking notes. So I got question question number one, Kim. She's on Twitter at Kim Wilson Daniel, and she's on Facebook at Kimberly Wilson Daniel, and she'll have the notes, and you'll be able to look at those notes. But here 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 here's my first question: as a school leader. 
What is my role in relationship to being, to, I'm sorry, my role in relationship to my students and staff in discussions on social justice, social unrest, uprisings, rebellions, and riots? What is my role? That's, that's the question right there. And, and here, I'm going to start it off with my definition of, well, what is social justice education? I've shared this months ago but it was time to revisit it. My definition of social justice education, and I'm, and, and I'm sorry I don't have this on screen written text for you, but I, as I've said to folks that, that, that have been with me the whole week, they know that I can't, I can't do elaborate presentations on Facebook Live because people pay me to, to do presentations. And if I'm doing the same thing they pay me for on a Saturday morning on Facebook and Twitter Live and YouTube Live, then they're gonna call me and say, yo, you need to send me a refund. So I can't give that to you. I gotta do it this way. So. Social justice education is the ongoing student-centered exploration, examination, and assessment of the world upon which your students exist through their own lens. That's key. Let me read that to you again. That's only portion of the, of the definition. Social justice education is the ongoing student-centered exploration, examination, and assessment of the world upon which your students exist through their own lens. So before I go any further, I'm saying that I want to have a discussion with students in terms of what they saw, because whatever it is they saw is a part of their world. Now, I am mindful of the fact that there are students in schools who are the children of the ones we saw on television. I get that. I'm, I'm not ignorant of that. I know that those students exist too. And that's why there's got to be some, some, some norms of engagement when you talk to your students. There is no free for all. See, that's you in, in terms of the culture of your classroom, leader, the, the, the culture of your school in terms of always having norms of engagement because we're not going after one another. We're not doing that. Right. So there are norms of engagement in terms of how we go about how we broach these discussions, because we know that we've got various different perspectives that are there. Right. So with that said, social justice education, again, is the ongoing student centered exploration. So we're exploring examination. So we're going deep and assessment. So we're evaluating the world upon which your students exist through their own lens. It's an interdisciplinary critical analysis of the world around them with respect to their relationship with it and how they fit in it via their own self-expression relative to issues of social justice, social injustice, and overall systemic, institutional, and individual racism, whether it be implicit or explicit. Now that, that was a lot, man. I, I, I gotta read that second part to you again, because that, that was a lot. It's an interdisciplinary critical analysis of the world around them. It means, so meaning social justice education is not confined to the history teacher. It's not confined to the language arts teacher. Social, ju social justice education has a significant place in a math lesson, in a science lesson, social studies, language arts, PE, health in particular, right? CTE, home economics, if that was still around, we know it's not, but, but if it was, right? I mean, you name it, any course imaginable in a school, social justice education has a home, has a place right that's that's the point that i'm that, that i'm making so so it's inter it's an interdisciplinary critical analysis of the world around them with respect to their relationship with it and how they fit in it via their own self-expression rel and, and i underscored that self-expression relative to issues of social justice social injustice overall systemic institutional and individual racism because you know you know, institutional and individual racism are two different things, right? See, when we talk about institutional, we're talking systemic. When we talk an individual, we're just talking about somebody's somebody's race, somebody's prejudice against somebody else. 
So those are two entirely different conversations. So here's what I'm going to do. It's like 12 o'clock almost. I've got like, oh, man, I, I've, I've, I've got two pages of notes to go. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to hit this this first, this this next part, which would be question number. So Kim Wilson, Dan, Kim, Kim Wilson, Daniel, the definition was question two. What does the term social justice education mean to me? That was the question which I didn't give you. So number two. What does social justice education mean to me? Number one, as a school leader, what is my role in relationship to my students and staff and discussions on social justice, social unrest, uprisings, rebellions, and riots? What I wanna do is just do number three, and then we are gonna cut it off, and I'm gonna ask you guys to join me next Saturday, and we are gonna get into the classroom now. We are gonna get into the school. See, today I needed to do this backdrop. I need to do this historical backdrop. I had to do that. I had to give it context. Watch the tape over. To get to, you know, just to kind of watch it and process it again. And then um next week I'll do number four, five, six, and seven. And, and we'll get deep into your role as leader in the school, teacher's role as teacher in the classroom. But before I do, I want to cover number three right now in real time. So number three is what are the reasons that social justice education either exists or doesn't exist in my school? Once again, what are the reasons? This social justice education either exists or doesn't exist in my school. So, so I so, so here I, I got these like eight short, seven short questions, and and letter and I I I, 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 I categorize them as letters. So letter A, B, C, D, E. So letter A, what is my board's position? So think about the question I just asked. What are the reasons that it exists or doesn't exist? Letter A, what is my school board's position? That's a consideration. Right. It, it might exist because the school board mandates it. It might exist because the school board said to the superintendent, we need to be about the business of social justice education in our school. Or it could be the school board say, uh -uh, we're not bringing that into the school. So I'm saying. So therefore, what is my school board's position? Letter B. What is my superintendent's position? Let me let me speak in a hypothetical right now. I thought of, as, as I watched everything unfold on the 6th and the 7th and the 8th and the 9th, I, I thought to myself, if I'm a superintendent, because I've been I've been running away from that position for years now, y'all. I'm certified. I've been recruited. I've been running away from it for years. And and I but I'm always thinking, but what if I was? If I was superintendent, just hear me well, because because I know it's I'm sure a superintendent's watching here, beyond Superintendent Fitch. I said, if I was superintendent, I would have had a Zoom call with my principals and assistant principals and directors and assistant superintendents, my cabinet, that day. We would have watched it unfold. And then that night, because see, as superintendent, I got access to my principals 24 seven. So at about, let's just, just, just to throw a time out there so that everybody could watch, watch it on the news, digest it and all that. I say about eight or nine o'clock that night, I'd have had my whole district administrative team on a Zoom call discussing our next steps. That's that's me if I was superintendent. And, and although I'm not in that position, I can tell you that definitively. And folks on here who know me, you know that's how I get down. You know that that's what I would have done. I would have called every, every administrator on my team, look, I need you guys on at nine o'clock. Cause, because I'm not I'm not having folks just like like running roughshod, right? I'm I, I'm going to give direction to this, but I'm but I am going to give the flexibility, the leeway for them to be able to to engage in the conversation. But I still want to do it as a team. I want us as a school district on the same page, not work, not necessarily saying the same thing, but 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 there's some commonality in there. That's me if I'm superintendent. I'm not going to just leave it to my schools to all be different because I had teachers and, and, and assistant principals writing me on social media saying to me, Principal Confect, because I wrote a, I gave some advice on how to approach this on my social media threads on the 7th, right? What, what it was called, what should the schools be doing right now? And folks were writing me on the thread. They're like, my, my, um, none of my assistant, um, teachers were saying, None of the students knew what it was or teachers were saying none of the leaders said anything to us. And parents were saying my children came home and they said nobody mentioned anything. And I'm saying, man, 
no need to be afraid of this, but it needs to be given direction from the top leadership. So if I'm board members, because it could be board members on here. If I'm board, I'm if I'm the board, I'm calling the superintendent. And then once and and then and then that superintendent, I'm calling my foot soldiers, meaning my my my, my building leadership and my central office leadership. And then my principals, then I'm expecting them to reach out to the teachers. So that might be a late night email. By this time, might be 11 or 12 o'clock at night, sending to the teachers, here we are. Right. So 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 now there's communication as opposed to everybody running in different directions. And now you got a war in your school. See, that's why the communication or you got a war in your school because you got one that's taking it this way, another taking it this way. And now you got the staff at odds virtually, if that's what you are in virtual space. And now it's, it becomes counterproductive. Something that happened at D.C., affecting your school up in Illinois, affecting your school down in Texas, affecting your school way out in California, something that happened in D.C. because you didn't take control of it. Got to take control. That's what leaders do. That's why I said, see, I'm on the building level now, but I'm but I'm not I'm, I'm going to do most of it next week. Number three, letter C. What is my principal's position, which I just spoke to? So I don't need to elaborate. Teachers should know. Hey, principal watching me right now. Today is January 9th. This happened January 6th. If you've got teachers in your building right now in real time, that still don't know where you stand in terms of how we approach this. Shame on you. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm going to go back to my words in the beginning. It is unacceptable. It is not okay. See, I'm not saying you got to put your views out there. I'm saying what is your position on how we approach it? They should know that by now. Because if they don't know, they may run in a direction that you may not want. They may bite you in your butt later on. You got you, you, you to you gotta have your hand in it. Letter D, what is my comfort level? Ah, I probably shouldn't even put that one out here right now because I need time with it. What's your comfort level? See, that that's, that speaks to your, you know, like, 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 like yeah, that speaks to your, your confidence. It speaks to your efficacy. What's your comfort level in engaging your staff in this conversation? I don't, and I don't mean engaging your staff in what I talked about. You know, I ain't, I'm not talking about you engaging your staff in Tulsa and Rosewood and lynching. I'm, and, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that. You got to build a culture for that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, what is your position? What is your comfort level in acknowledging that January 6th even happened? You see, I, man, I, I see I, one, 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 one of my colleagues, I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if, 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 if he would want me to say his name. But one of my colleagues is on here. And, and, and at the time that we met, he was on my staff as a teacher. Now he's a principal. He knows we're going to have this conversation, man. We're going to have it with the students. We're going to go to the auditorium and we're going to have a school wide conversation. We're going to have it with staff. This is what we're going to do. But I had a comfort in doing that because I didn't get into this business to be afraid. Let me say that again. I did not get into this business of leadership to be afraid. I do not admire the various leaders in history and contemporarily who have done mighty things in their in their journey. I don't admire them to be afraid to replicate. them. See. I'm 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 just not built that way. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be intimidated, especially when doing what I need to do is the right thing by children. See, if it's the right thing by children, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be strategic. You know, we talk about that all the time in this academy. I'm going to be strategic. I'm not going to be a rebel. Right? I'm going to be strategic in what I do, but it's going to get done. So what's your comfort level? Letter E, what is my competence level? Ooh. What is my competence level? I appreciate you guys writing all these comments, by the way. And, I, and, and you know, I read them when I'm done. I read them all. Last week we had um, we had a thousand, literally. I read all 1,000 and that was just on Facebook. Then on the virtual side, Virtual AP Leadership Academy, we had another 300. Then on the Twitter side, we had a whole 
much whole lot of them. I was gonna say, like we said when we were kids, we had a whole mess of them, right? And then on the YouTube side, it was it was a, it was it was an abundance of them as well. So I read them all. That's how I spend my Saturday, reading all these comments. They said, "Man, this guy don't have no life." Yeah, that's what I do, right? So so again, what is my competence level? In other words, what do you know? Like, what are you reading? See, you like like the things I expressed this morning. I only know it because I read it and went to lectures and, and, and surrounded myself with, with, with people who can teach me. That's how I know. So I'm saying to you, I'm asking you the question, and maybe we'll do a session on this at another time. What are you reading? What are you reading? Are you reading the right stuff? Are you reading the stuff that's consistent with you being the best version of yourself with your students as it relates to these complicated issues. What are you reading? This library alone, you can't even see it all. It's a lot there. It's a lot there for you. I got the book list. Go to my principalcafelewrites.com with a plural, rights. Principalcafelewrites.com. Scroll way down. And you'll see my book list for teachers that teach black children. It's there. Then go on Amazon and get some of them books. I break it down by category. Let me finish up. So what is my competence? Well, you got you got to read, but you got to also interact with people who can who, who can give you inform you. So and, and let me say this to you. If you've got some teacher on your staff, which I know you do, who may happen to be African-American. And this person's knowledgeable on these issues. Don't 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 you have that pride so high that you can't go to this person and pick this person's brain just because they're a teacher. I learn from my teachers. I ain't I ain't intimidated by my teachers because I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm good with that. See, it's only the one that feels they have to be the smartest person in the room that can't learn from other people. But but if you're but if you're willing to embrace the fact that you've got smarter people than you in the room, then now you go to some of these people who know certain things that you don't know and 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 dialogue with them. One of my superintendents used to come to me all the time. He happened to be white. He was from the suburbs, and he and he and he, he was an urban principal. I mean, superintendent, and he would come to me. Kafele, you know you know where I where I grew up. You know my world. I don't know this stuff. Talk to me. I respected that. Cause he admitted what he didn't know. So we talk behind closed doors about these kinds of issues. That's how it's gotta be. Let me keep going, I'm almost done. Letter F, we got F and G. Letter F, what kind of rapport slash relationship do I have with my students? So when we talk about having these issues of social, I'm, I'm saying you, the, um, the, 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 the leader in terms of your dialogue, what, what rapport relationship do you have with your students, but also your teachers? What, what rapport, what kind of rapport relationship do they have with their students that they can have these conversations? Because the conversations have to be had. But if there's no rapport, if there's no relationship, then it can blow up in your face. So, 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 so not to put the cart before the horse, you gotta the the the, the, the initial intent is building rapport, building relationship. So that now I can have any kind of conversation with student, right? And then letter G, what kind of rapport slash relationship do I have with my students' parents? Oh, man. I need more time on that one, but I'm not going to take it. But I'll say this. I'm not going to engage the students in these discussions until I made the parents aware that this is what I'm about. See, I can't, I'm not going to run the risk of parent coming in yelling and cursing at me because I engaged her, his or her child in discussions that they wouldn't want their child to have a discussion on. I'm going to let them know. I'm going to send out a letter. I'm going I'm I'm to reach out and let the parents know that, you know, this is what we do. Right. And, and, and I'm, and I'm going to win them over so that they understand I'm not, I'm not doing your child any harm. We're just, we're, we're growing your children, right? We're growing them. And we're we're having we're allowing them to have these 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 tough conversations. But remember how I discuss, remember how I define social justice education. I said it's student centered. It's not about the teacher. When it's about the teacher, it's it's, it's teacher driven indoctrination. 
as opposed to student centered um, social justice education. So we got to we got to draw that line of demar demarcation to make sure that we're on point. Doesn't mean that you don't have input. But it does mean that you're not necessarily framing the conversation because it's about the student. But you do have input. They do have an opportunity to hear your views. But it's not about your views. It's about them, the students. So with that said, folks, I'm going to do a part two next week. And part two will focus solely on the school, the classroom. Today was focused on the backdrop. So, so let me say, let me give you this part in question as some homework for you guys to do. Uh, part in question, what measures will I take toward furthering toward further becoming an effective social justice educator. And keep them comments coming. I will be reading them all. I got nothing to do today but read. So I'm gonna be reading all these comments. So keep them coming. In fact, share this one more time, retweet it one more time. Let them know. Fele was dropping some bombs today, right? Let them know. Um, so again, what measures will I take toward further becoming an effective social justice educator? Next week, part two of this same discussion, but I told you how we are gonna do it. Next. Get this in your hands. You can go to Amazon right now. Assistant Principal 50. I'm, I'm trying to play my role. I'm not trying to be the guru, but I'm trying to play my role in helping assistant principals become the best assistant principals that they can possibly be. And then, but you, but I know that you're not stri striving to stay at the assistant principalship. You want to be a principal. So I wrote this, the aspiring Principal 50. Get that in your hands as well. Get them both. So visit principalcafele.com for additional resources right and then subscribe to my school leadership thoughts uh channel on youtube again sub uh, school leadership thoughts subscribe to that like and follow my facebook page virtual assistant principal leadership academy and in, in the age of covid with with with, with these new strength new, new strains out here I, you know i tell you every week the where it is some of you are new to me you never seen me before on in this in this form but you see me now Look, y'all, it's 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 not getting better. Don't 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 you know? Don't drink the Kool Aid. It's we're in, we're in 2021, so now it's better now. No, it's it, that was just a flip of the calendar. We still in the same the, the the same predicament that we've been in. So wear this, cover your mouth and nose. See, some people want to walk around like this here. Like they'll wear it like a chin strap. Like like then you might as well just go get yourself a football helmet. Right. And, and, and buckle up. Right. That, that's this. All this is you, you look like you missing your helmet. But this this ain't doing nothing. Because, see, if you if you doing it like this. All right, fine. You protecting me, but you ain't protecting yourself. And then and then you bring yourself around me later and your nose was spread open. You're going to infect me. You got to go this way, y'all. Here's how you how you do it like that. Yeah, I know you don't like how you look. You want, you know, you want to be out there looking like you, you know, your beard getting messed up now, your makeup getting messed up, whatever it is. But that's all right. Like, 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 if you like, let me get this here. Like, say you, you look, no, the fellas out there, you, you, you want your beard to be groomed, right? All right, take it off, get your comb, and go like this here. Now you good. You good. See. So that, that's all you got to do. If it's the makeup thing, get, you know, I don't know much about makeup, but get, get that little pad thing and go like this. <laughs> right. And now, <laughs> now you good. Right. So put the mask on. Make sure you get the diet right. Get the exercise in. And then I don't have to have somebody tell me later on. Oh man, such and such was a faithful listener to the academy and they succumbed to COVID. Man, I don't want to hear that. So just do what you're supposed to be doing, right? So with that said, folks, I appreciate you. I hope I, I hope that everybody was able to internalize this. We got more coming next week. So, but in the meantime, between now and next Saturday, have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up because I approve this message. And then cock your fist back and count the three with me. One, two, three. Bam! I see you guys in a week. Stay safe.